All right, and we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to TGI, the greatest indoor reading series. I'm your host, Ridge Craswell. Um, we have a wonderful lineup tonight of, I believe, is it all poets? I don't know. I should do more work ahead of time. Noli shaking her head furiously, no. It's at least one poet. <laughs> uh, sorry, three poets, thank you. I'm getting a lot of helpful hand gestures. This is why I find gallery view helpful. At any rate, um, thank you guys so much for joining us. We are here again. Um, we have been here every week since uh, the end of March 2020 and are now uh, continuing uh, despite being in very different locations. I uh, find myself this week in Phoenix, Arizona, um, where I will be for the next uh 19 weeks I think I have left um, doing some some training down here and uh, it's sunny that's what I'll say about Phoenix it's very sunny and it's not winter it's very strange at any rate uh, this is an amazing um, once again you know there, there are things going on in the world but there's there's nothing that I feel like is a dire issue that I have to address. So I think uh, we can pretty much uh, get directly to it. Although I will address an issue on a bit of a uh, personal me. I'm going to give a Mia culpa. This is an official TGI Mia culpa. Our first reader tonight is a wonderful poet who I had a wonderful conversation with that was uh, going to be a podcast, except then I was unable to generate the responsibility necessary to finish editing it. And uh, the podcast on top of the standard workload and life load was a bit too much. And now it, it sort of snowballed and now it has reached a point where that, that discussion that we had, while great, is not really relevant to the world anymore because it actually took place so long ago that it was before the last presidential election. So I would like to A, apologize to Terry, and B, uh, ask her if when I do feel prepared, she would be willing to speak with me again uh, so that we could we could generate uh, 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 some discussion and, and maybe some, um, I don't know. I just, I enjoyed the process. It's just a lot of work. And yes, uh, as Trina says, uh, I have mentioned this almost every time uh, after the show, when I scroll down the list of who's coming on and going like, ooh, February 12th, though, Terry's coming. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm sure she is not as worried about it as I was, and I'm trying not to worry about it now. But these are the things that happen. Uh, life continues to change. We adapt. We overcome as best we can, and we move forward. So without further uh, rigmarole, higgledy piggledy, or foofaraw from myself. Uh, I'm going to introduce Terry and we will get going with the readings for tonight. Uh, Terry Ellen Cross Davis is the author of A More Perfect Union, available now, uh, winner of the 2019 journal Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize, uh, and Haint from 2016 from Give All Press, winner of the 2017 Ohioana Book Award for Poetry. She is the 2020 winner of the Poetry Society of America's Robert H. Winner Memorial Award and a finalist for the PSA's George Bogan Memorial Award. She's the recipient of a 2019 Sustainable Arts Grant and a Merit Grant from the Freya Project. A Cave Canem Fellow and a member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective, she has been awarded residencies at the Community of Writers Workshop, Hedgebrook, the Soul Mountain Writers Retreat, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. Her work has been published in many anthologies. There is a list of them, which we will make readily available to you if you'd like, but for now, I will say two of them, uh, Bum Rush the Page, a deaf poetry jam, and Gathering Ground, a reader celebrating Cave Canem's first decade. Uh, and her work can also be found in many journals, including Arlejo, Auburn Avenue, Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Delaware Poetry Review, Fledgling Rag, and others. She's the poetry coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and she lives in Maryland with her husband, the poet Hayes Davis, and their two children. Without any more from me, Terry, you should be able to unmute yourself and take us away. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you, TGI Cats, for having me back. I'm really excited to be back. I'm happy to have my book to like physically read from. Um, I'm just gonna share uh, three poems with you. 
uh, and first we're going to be serious and then the second one, you know, it's Valentine's Day so we're going to go there. We're just going to go there. Uh, <laughs> so um, this first poem is for my children. It's for my son um, who just turned 10 on the second. And it's called Partis Sequitur Ventrum, which is a Latin phrase that stands for the principle that the children of an enslaved woman are themselves born as slaves and owned by their mother's master. It's in two parts, the first part, mourning. His knobby six-year-old knees, his anxious pace as if to keep step with the question steady overflow. Is there a giant octopus in the Bermuda Triangle? How is paper made? How do fireworks know when to explode? No one told me black boys could burn so bright. Wait, I'm wrong. The dark sky has seen their fire, snuffed by white hoods, malevolent blue eyes, and bluer uniforms. White women's screams all have been matched to their tender wood. So I hug my son tight, kiss the curl cropped so close it's straight. My mother eye insatiable. He is dessert and I'll always have seconds. Each morning I lick my thumb, clean him up good, wishing in vain the amniotic sac had dried to armor. Two, night. His lisp, loose syrupy sweet, sneaks into my ear. Feel its heat, small source, more flicker than flame, flanked by arms still dreaming of muscle. He claims my squishy stomach the best pillow. If the security of our locked arms could extend beyond growth spurts, clocks, calendars, to the someone interviewing him, to the someone following him in the store, to the someone holding my son's life in trembling fingers poised above a phone's keypads, let my love be a note safety pinned to his chest, send him back alive, unharmed. As a black mother in America, I know my wells are birthright, pinned with iron, pinned in ink. And for Valentine's Day, we'll start here and then we'll end with a little love for Prince because I always loved Prince. That was my first love and will always be. Um, so this poem is called Escape Ladder and it uses a word I never know how to pronounce, chitin, because I don't, I, I only read it. But um, so, you know, a chitin, like the little, Greek thing that they wear like a, like a toga, whatever. Escape ladder. The dead end nights of it, too tired for it. A kiss ends it. He turns on his side, you sleep on it. Oh, the pull, the pull of the black hole of wonder. Imagine your own consumption, reckless lips, a new lover, the island dew of you, sweat over sinew. Pick a man, far from your fingertips. Scotch tape his tiger beat picture in your mind's locker. A crush is just a way to re-engorge the soft tissues of want. Help the sun sprint the sky. Chariot wheels greased by lust. Apollo's cheeks peeking under a loose chitin. And um, this last one, in, in this book, I came up with um, nine goddesses. I just created my own goddesses, right? And so this one is the goddess of idolatry and it has an epigraph from Romeo and Juliet. And it's Juliet saying, swear by thy gracious self, which is the God of my idolatry. So for all you Prince fans, you will hear all kinds of things in here. One, go to him bear, he loves these noon rendezvous. Two, encamp the lyrics to when two are in love. Cultivate lightning strikes between your thighs. Three, be his Gemini, find your Camille. Let Chacadelica make you squeal. Let him plead and twirl his way into your pants. Court heartbreak for just one night with his face. Purple electricity, flowers littered on a white floor. Do it in the limousine. Tonight, live the fantasy, bubble bath, pants on. Four. Purify yourself in Lake Minnetonka. Be his center without care. Invoke erotic city. Make it come alive. Taste his hot flash of animal lust. Fingers dipping up and down, in and out around your lake. Become delirious. Bring pandemonium. 
And since gigolos get lonely too, make yourself free for a couple of hours, maybe the next seven years, always be in his hair. Five, every Friday night, his music is his body. In remembrance of him, take it inside you. Six, make your love shout. Seven, April, let the rain come. 17 days, 17 long nights. Gold, dig the pitcher. Purple tulips and lilacs wilting after a tempest. Then drink the overflow. There we go. Thank you. All right, Terry, thank you so much. Um, those were wonderful, you know, I guess working backwards. Um, the the sort of sensuality and uh, uh, I love that the, the, the final thing you read there is also like a list of like of things to remind yourself almost it, it feels like of, of ways to um, think about or reconsider or recommit to you know not just a relationship but like the physical elements of a relationship as well um, and similarly with the second one you know it's one of those things that's i it always strikes me at least that it's very difficult to i think it's very difficult in 2021 and 2020 and 2019 all the way it's been a while um it's very difficult to write earnestly about some things and about love or or sexuality is it's very difficult to like for people to it almost feels intolerable to some people, this expression of it, you know, like it's, it's difficult for people to, to, to read, to hear, to feel, to really connect to. And I think your work does such a good job of sort of unfolding that in a way that um, places us in the, like in, whether it's your perspective or the perspective of the sort of narrator of, of the poem, it, it really, it really just, gets me right in there. And I, I think it's wonderful. And I also think um, inventing a goddess is always a good idea. Invent your own religion. Why not? I mean, we have, first of all, I, the, many, many things you can Google. I'm sure you can find a patron saint for or a god for or whatever. But if not, and if you have a particular desire or a particular um, goal in mind, there is nothing wrong with uh, externalizing that i mean i that's kind of i don't know we don't need to get into the truth or not truth of anything but i've always looked at it as essentially uh people make gods in order to make ideals external so that we have something to reach towards instead of just sitting there feeling crummy that we can't get there <laughs> um and then, you know, on a more serious note, you know, the last time we had you on and, and also the last time I spoke to you, you know, we were still um, really in the throes of, of the Black Lives Matter movement, of the cultural sort of, you know, reaction to, to this string of um, police killings and, and all this. And I remember distinctly um, hearing from yourself and from several other black women writers that we've had on, you know, this idea of sort of dire concern for your sons, for your children. And, you know, it really, um, it, it's something that I'm intellectually aware of all the time, but I think it's really helpful to me, um, who, you know, we've talked, I've talked about this much, like, I, generally speaking, police leave me alone. I don't have any interaction with them because I'm a huge, you know, huge white guy wandering around. Um, but it's really good for me to emotionally remember the perspective of others, especially when they're coming out into a world that they don't feel is safe and that there are people at home worried about them and that there are people who have to think about um, I remember we had, um, Trina might be able to remind me who it was. We had one writer on the show who was, was, was it Sakina who was pregnant at the time? Oh, yeah. Sakina Hoffler came and read on the show uh, fairly early on and she was pregnant at the time. And, and she actually, you know, I don't remember if they knew if it was a boy or a girl or not, but she talked about how, you know, if it's a boy, we're going to have to talk to him about this. We're going to have to talk to him about how to deal with police. We're going to have to talk to him about, 
you know, if he gets pulled over, putting his hands up on the dashboard. And it's just like how anyone can declare inequality solved or stop worrying about it because one of the blue team got elected president is fooling themselves. And I think art and poetry and any expression that that touches this is so important. Uh, I don't want to go on too, too long, but I will say like last week at the end of the show, we had some kids come in to the room um, uh, and um, jump on Zoom bombers. And, you know, they're probably 14 and they think that typing slurs and harmful language into the chat is funny. And I'm not going to argue with them because what's the point? They're 14, but at the same time, they don't understand that the words that they're choosing to use to try to shock adults have a history a thousand years or more long of harming people and of being used to promote structures that harm people. And uh, I don't know, I guess uh, just all I can really say is, is, you know, thank you for providing something that helps us connect to that. Um, as people who, where that's not necessarily the world we have to live in, um, because as being the best allies that we can requires an emotional understanding as well as an intellectual one. So it's always great to hear you. It's, it's, it's really is. And it's nice to see you. And, uh, if I, if I get my proverbial poop together, we will have to do another interview and try to promote your book. So thank you so much, Terry. Actually, Terry, uh, actually, if you'd like to respond, let me um, let me just uh, ask you to unmute it. I, I don't know if you have anything oh. to say in response, please. I'm not I'm just going to say, you know, um, Black Lives Matter, and they've always mattered. And whether or not it's popular, <laughs> it's, I'm still going to be Black next week yep. and next month and next year. Um, so just just the thing. And it is scary to have kids. There are times I, I really thought hard, like, did I make the right decision? to, and it, it almost feels like, you know, cannon fodder. Um, and you think about, remember in Florida, they had uh, the police who put up the pictures of black, uh, black prisoners and, you know, shoot at those pictures. It was like, it's just a scary thing for a, a son or a daughter, for any small brown child running around right now. And even for me as a petite black woman, I've had some horrible run-ins with the police, not a threat to anyone, you know, but, yet here we are so yeah all those things and no it's great to be back and i really appreciate you all having me back so thank you very much terry and uh as with all the writers by the way if anyone who's attending this live uh wants to hang around uh, afterwards if you have a question or something feel free um we usually keep the room open for a bit i know people have to run and make dinner and help help parent and things like that but you know, I encourage also people to check out the chat right now because you can find a link to purchase Terry's book, which is now available, and uh, you should do so. Look, only has one. <laughs> All right, uh, we will pivot to our next writer uh, this evening is Susanna H. Case. She is the author of seven books of poetry, most recently, and I really like this title, Dead Shark on the End Train from Broadstone Books 2020, which won a Pinnacle Book Award for the Best Poetry Book. She's also the author of five chat books. Her first collection, The Scottish Cafe from Slapering Hole Press, was re-released in a dual-language English-Polish version, which I definitely should have asked for help with pronouncing. <laughs> I'm going to guess... Uh, Kavia Mia Shkaka? We'll see. Uh, that will, I can uh, always uh, cut and paste that. But that was published by Opole University Press, and she has also been translated into Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. Case is a professor and program coordinator at the New York Institute of Technology in New York City, and she can be reached at SusannaHCase.com. That's one and in Susanna. Susanna, you should be able to unmute yourself, and you can take us away. So, yeah. So I can't help you with the pronunciation because I don't know what you <laughs> Um, but I, I put my website and stuff in the chat and yes, I'm sorry, Noli, I kind of took, took your job and uh, Terry, that was wonderful. And we, we're actually journal mates at uh, Beltway. So I think we probably know some of the same people. 
So um, I'm reading from Dead Shark on the End Train, and you can see on the cover is a 1930s WPA painting of uh, New York City subway from, um, by uh, Lily Faridi, a uh, w 1930s WPA painter. And um, there's a lot of uh, violence in this book, um, just to, to warn you, and a lot of implicit violence. And uh, some of it is gender-based, a lot of it is gender-based, some of it isn't. And we'll start with this one, Walking Home. The girl walking home alone doesn't know what to do about the stranger who calls her name. He claims he has a gun. He, his knowing her name is a gun. He blocks her way. Rail track, chain link fence, no parking sign. It's like that test she had in school yesterday, having to choose which animal doesn't belong. She guessed it was the cow. This girl knows nothing of farms. On her left, the empty tennis club. In front, the man who snarls he will kill her. Let me see the gun in her piccolo voice. A train rushes by. If she were in it, her life would be different. The world is full of noise. Weeds, cigarette butts, rusted car, locked shed. She runs. She doesn't know if he can keep up. He's too old to catch her. He screams again, I'll kill you. She doesn't look back. So that, this is a poem of escape. And here's one that's less so. And I wrote this poem after, I, I teach in a university and I, after uh, uh, a couple of cops came to the university to give us all training and what we should do if there was an active shooter situation. And this is called active shooter. He had a well thought out system. He appeared off brand weird. He was solo 98% of the time. He wasn't stupid any of the time. He appeared to know the building. He planned the operation. He was a quiet man, everyone said, never a problem. He was a problem. He was a monster. He was not a monster. He did a monstrous thing. He shot for seven to 11 minutes. We didn't pay that extra minute of attention. We tried our concealment. The weapons bullets penetrated our desks. The weapons bullets penetrated the partitions between our cubicles. 38 cal, nine mil, 12 gauge, M67 for the AK-47. The weapons penetrated our file cabinets. We confused concealment and cover. We had no cover. We were lizards dreaming like birds. Um, here's a poem that, spread, that, that points to actually a more widespread um, type of violence, not gun based at all, more politically based. And it's called Herds. The men are unloading goats from a boat onto the sandy beach of Paliocara. A few goats escape, run wild through the port, only to be surrounded, tied up, and carted by wheelbarrow into town while a large pelican sits on the beach wall watching. This happens often, both before and after the refugees arrive, half dead, from across the Mediterranean, Somali, Sudanese, Egyptian, Syrian. They've mistaken the island for Italy. Herded into a gym, police paint registration numbers on their arms. As they sleep, names are ignored. We are human, we have names, they complain. There is so little left in some parts of the world even the goats have names. This poem is called Diva and it's written for and after Maria Callas, the singer. 
And you'll hear two other people referenced in the poem, not by name. And uh, you know, of course, um, we know that she was in a, a love triangle with Jackie Kennedy and Aristotle Onassis, who uh, dumped uh, Maria Callas for Jackie Kennedy. So this is Diva. If you're forced to sing as a child and you hate it, you'll replace devotion to singing with love. If the man you love pushes you to retire from the world to serve only him, your talent just opens a hole in the earth for you to fall through. And if you're the chubby, ugly duckling as a child in your mind, you'll always be the chubby, ugly duckling even after you bring in piles of money, a public waiting online for days to hear you. Even when you lose so much weight, you stress your voice. You'll be the difficult one, the one who is gossiped about when the man you love isn't the man you married. If the man you love leaves you to woo the most famous woman in the world because she represents America more refined, even thinner, then you, you'll hole up in your apartment until he begs you to take him back, threatening to crash his Mercedes into your building if you won't. But if you've abdicated your power, agreeing to be the lesser wife, you don't have the only thing a man obsessed with power wants. It doesn't matter that you feel like a woman. He will disappear for weeks, forget to phone, call you, a cunt with a whistle in her throat. Still, you'll sneak in through the service entrance to see him one last time when he's dying. His canary, you'll call yourself, your voice cracking on the high C. Yes, I see in the comments, someone says, don't take him back, which is was probably would have been good advice and which he probably should have followed. There's one other um, celebrity, I guess you'd say, that makes her appearance in this book, and I'll close on that poem. This is called The Unpublished Poems of Marilyn Monroe, and she actually did write a number of poems. Marilyn in a striped swimsuit reading Ulysses, photographed by Eve Arnold, 1955. She wanted blondes to be thought sexy and astute. She wanted herself to be thought astute. Blonde, pejorative, 19th century, as in dizzy blonde, as in a blonde moment, as in risque British burlesque performer, as in French courtesan, courtesan Rosalie Duthay. Marilyn left fragments of handwritten texts, crossed out words, inserted phrases, her memories, dreams, fears, enjammed. The public knew only the lines of her Cupid's bow, but no silly woman would stand by Arthur Miller as he refused to name communists. Marilyn, surrounded by 430 books with penciled notes, writes to herself, our life, they have cheated you. Thank you. All right, Susanna, thank you so much. Those were uh, wonderful. I think um, not not to immediately draw a comparison, but I think at least for me, you know, your first poem, uh, sort of similar to what I was talking to Terry about, really let me in on a, a type of fear and discomfort that I never have to experience. Um, and the way that you did so was so deft and so it's such an interesting thing to sort of have this idea of the the i guess for lack of a better term protagonist of the poem sort of almost it's like there's a threat but she almost doesn't take it seriously because there are threats constantly uh it felt like and i, I think that's a really interesting and sort of revealing thing and i think you know the the remaining work really um speaks to people's perceptions of women as much as uh i don't want to how do i say this speaks to the problem or the the fallacy or whatever you want to call it the issue that people's perceptions of women are often considered to have more value or bearing than women's perceptions of themselves 
Um, Good point. Yeah. And especially with maybe people who are in the public eye. I mean, I, I, people don't, well, I don't know at the time I wasn't around, but people, it doesn't seem to me that people ever really considered Marilyn Monroe a human being. She was sort of decoration more than anything else, you know, and, and there is something in that that is, you know, the idea of <clears throat> her having been with, with um, Arthur Miller and having, you know, <laughs> having dealt with these real life circumstances, you know, her life was a three dimensional human being's life. It was not uh, giggling and whatever it's portrayed as sort of a cartoon. Um, and then the other, um, the, the intermediate poem or sort of in the middle poem about the mass shooting, um, you know, on the way here, a um, couple weeks ago, I drove from uh, New York to Phoenix, Arizona, obviously had a lot of time on my hands. So I listened to a bunch of podcasts and podcasts, as everyone may know, are largely about crime. That's most podcasts, as far as I can tell. I and I, what's that? I didn't know that. That's, that's oh, There's a lot of true crime podcasts. And um, I learned about a man named Harold Unruh who was essentially the first mass shooter. He, um, it was 1949. And if you read the story about why, why he says he did it, it is exactly the same as all the other ones. And it was fascinating, you know, COVID, because there have not been large gatherings of people, I suspect there have not been these incidents but this is a real uniquely American problem. Yes. And I think, I also think it has something to do with the same reason that a man would be yelling at a woman in an attempt to first uh, hit on her or whatever, and then slowly becoming more and more threatening. Um, so I just think it's really fascinating to sort of, um, I guess, put these two issues side by side in a sense. And I really appreciate that you included that because not only is that about another fear of violence and, and terror, uh, it's also, you know, if you look at the male character in it or the aggressor, um, there's some sort of mm, overlap, I guess. Uh, was that any, I guess the only question I would have is, is, is that um, sort of uh, conscious or, or is it more that you're just looking around the world and kind of looking for topics and things that sort of provoke things within you? Uh, no, I'm interested in gender violence. I write about it a lot. I, um, I also teach a gender course, so it's, it's always with me, yeah. yeah. The, the, the poem, that first poem, it was based on a, an actual experience as a child. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm again, you know, m these difficult issues that we tend to ignore because they disrupt the primary narrative of this country and of culture, you know, it's so important. And I've always said on this show, um, you know, for me, at least my experience of poetry is it, it sneaks around the back door and gets inside in, in a very interesting way and changes my mind. So you know, much like um, with all the other things that I've, I've gotten to hear, I feel like I've gotten to selfishly uh, hear a tremendous amount of thought provoking and, you know, growth provoking material and, and yours was right along there. So thank you very much for, for coming you. and sharing. All right. Wow. We are off to a strong start. We're always on a strong start and a strong middle and a strong end. We're strong. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's very much Friday for me. I'm I'm a bit tired, but I feel like I'm 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 being energized by this. So thank you all. Um, our next reader tonight is Jessica Sullivan. She is a writer, student, and reader. She's a reader for Barrel House, Little Patuxent, Patuxent Review, and Poet Lore, and her work can be found in Fiction Writers Review. She's usually over-caffeinated, staring at the sky, and daydreaming. She's currently pursuing her MFA in creative writing from American University. Jessica, you should be able to unmute yourself and you can take us away. Great. Um, thank you all so much for inviting me to um, be here tonight. Um, so I'm going to read part of a short story, which I have realized over the course of the week 
was not so short. Um, but it's set in this world where for um, Black people specifically, um, for every microaggression and um, just aggression in general, then they lose a part of their melanin. Um, and so this follows an unnamed narrator and their family, well, their dad, um, as they um, go through that work. Um, so I'm gonna start from the part where they've just, um, they at a friend's house for dinner after working in retail. So their um, device that monitors the melanin, which is called a blackometer is pretty low. Okay. Harry has been your friend since you were children. In the kitchen, he is leaning against the stove while his dad stirs something in a pot. He nods in greeting, tells you that his parents have friends coming over for dinner, that they want you both to join them. Phil and Delilah, Harry's parents, entertain their guests, Kevin and Rose. When dinner is ready, you help Phil bring out the plates piled high with spaghetti. After a while, when everyone is almost done eating, Kevin turns to you. So, how do you like it here? He asks. What do you mean? You reply. Well, surely it must be different. It must be a lot different here than where you're from. Where is that again? You tell me you're from here. He looks at you, then at his wife, then back at you. Oh, you don't say. There I go putting my foot in my mouth. It's just, you know, you speak so well. I figured it was the second language. You open your mouth to say something, but don't. Instead, you bite the inside of your cheek and nervous habit you have. Your black meter dings. You pull it out of your back pocket, zero percent black. You look down at your arm, all your melanin and it's gone. Harry sees what happened. Maybe it's for the best, though, right? Now you can be like the rest of us. You push back your chair and run the six blocks home. You run up the steps, screeching to a halt in front of the egg white melt box, yanking down the lid and look inside. It's empty. You heard the bureau sends a letter when a person loses their blackness, but you've never seen one. You walk away from the mailbox and unlock the front door. Dad is standing at the base of the stairs, waiting. A postcard dangles in his hand. Without a word, he holds it out to you. You reach out and take it. On one side, there's a sock photo. Above the photo of the smiling man side, the words, you lost your blackness. You flip it over to read the details. Your black commuter has reached zero percent. It's time for you to make the choice. You can choose to remain white or attempt to regain your blackness. If you choose to regain your blackness, you have 24 hours to raise your blackness to a minimum of 40 percent. This postcard needs to be postmarked within one day to notify the Bureau of your decision. Next to the description are two checkboxes, one that says, I choose to remain white, and the other that says, I choose to remain black. You look up at your father. He doesn't look at you before entering the living room. He walks to the furthest window that overlooks the street, move to the archway, and watch him as he paces back and forth. I'm going to earn it back, you say in a small voice. You are ashamed that you lost it in the first place. He says nothing. The grandfather clock chimes on the half hour. It's 8.30. Normally, dad would be sitting on the couch, either reading or working on a puzzle, a cup of tea on the coffee table. Slowly, he stops pacing. He stands in your direction, but looks at his house shoes. Maybe you shouldn't earn it back, I mean. What? Of course I'm going to earn it back, you say. Life would be easy if you didn't. Life wouldn't be easier if you won't look at me, he snapped. I wouldn't have to worry about you going out at night. You wouldn't have to carry around a block meter. You could wear a hoodie and not be a threat. You wouldn't have to think about all the small things that shouldn't be a problem, but are. Don't you get that? You nod. I get it. You pause before continuing. I'm still learning it back. It feels right, even though he's right. So are you. He meets your gaze. I don't want you earning it back. He turns on his heel and walks into the dining room. You go upstairs to your room and shut the door. You plop down on your bed and look at the stock photo. You think about what your father said. You sit down the postcard, sit up, grab a pen, make two little lines in the second checkbox. You've made your choice. You get off your bed and open your closet, grabbing your black hoodie and throwing it on. You put the hood up and grab the postcard before rushing down the stairs and out the door. You place the postcard in the mail and push the little red flag up. You walk back through the suburb into the city. You go to 7-Eleven, the one on the other side of town. The overhead lights above. The gas pumps are flickering. You're slightly out of breath. You walk towards the gas station, keeping your head down and your hands shoved in your pockets. You push open the front door, setting off the bell to notify it by the employees of a new arrival. You stop briefly in the doorway, quickly taking in the aisles of candy, chips, and random essentials. You hear an employee say hello, but you don't respond. 
You turn away from the cash registers and wander into the aisle full of cleaning supplies, weaving through the store until you're standing in front of the candy display. Glancing up, you see the reflection in the mirror hanging by the doors. Twix, Kit Kats, and Milky Way bars all glitter in front of you. You reach out and wrap your fingers around the Twix bar, shoving it in your pocket. This is your first time stealing. You rush past the cash register on your way. Nobody stops you. You're almost home when you check your block the meter. Zero percent black. You sigh as you push open the front door. In the living room, Dad is sitting on the couch reading. His feet are propped up on, couch, on the coffee table. He looks at you as you enter. Let's make shuku shuku, he says, pushing himself off the couch. You nod and follow him into the kitchen. Automatically, you go to get the coconut, sugar, self-fried, and flour. Dad reaches in, reaches for the mixing bowls on the shelves next to the sink before taking a carton of eggs from the fridge. He must have gone grocery shopping today. He preheats the oven as you pour the sugar and coconut into the bowl. He separates the egg whites from the yolk before dropping them in. He hands you a wooden spoon and you mix the ingredients. He reaches in and takes a handful of the batter, rolls it into a ball, coats it in flour, and places it on, on the baking sheet. He follows suit. He taps you on the nose with his index finger, leaving a dusting of flour behind. You act appalled before placing a dollop of dough on his nose. He smiles and tries to touch his tongue to his nose to lick it off. You laugh as he flounders before using his hand to wipe it off and eat it. He turns to place the baking sheets in the oven before flicking a fistful of flour at you. You gasp as it cleans to your skin. He tries to contain his laughter. You pick up a handful of flour and fling it back. It, it sticks to his shirt, coating his skin. The timer in on the oven beeps, interrupting the fun. He grabs an oven mitt and, and removes the trays, setting them on the cooling racks. You let the flour fall through your fingers. He looks around, takes in the mess. We'll clean this up in the morning, he says as he takes the baking sheet into the dining room. You sit down on the hard wooden chair at the dining room, said that used to be your grandmother's before she died. You take a coconut ball from the baking sheet, ignoring the heat radi radiating into your fingers. Your father does the same. You take a bite, savoring the woody taste. Remember the first time we made these? I uh, had you up on the counter and you dumped the whole container of coconut on your head. You smile at the memory. It's been four years since your grandmother dies. Dead. He gets up and, walk quiet, and walks quietly back into the kitchen, taking the baking sheet, sheet with, with him. The next morning, you check your black opinion out of habit, 22% black. You blink in rapid succession to make sure you read that right. When you look again, it says the same, 22% black. You go downstairs in the faded gray sweatpants you slept in. You enter the kitchen where your dad is stirring his coffee with the pen cap. He's fully dressed in black slacks and a lilac button down. I thought I threw that shirt out, you say. Dad looks down at his shirt. I look good in this color. You think you look good in that color. He sighs before running upstairs to change. You beat him downstairs after changing out your sweatpants. When he comes back, he's changed into a simple black polo. You nod in approval as he heads towards the Old, toward the old rusted green hatch back. In the car, the engine comes to life, the stereo blast Martin Gay. Dad insists on buying CDs, a pile of them from various artists on the floor by your feet. You drive through the suburb to the outskirts of the city. The car glides into an empty parking space near an unassuming beige building. You're not religious, but you and your father go to this church every Sunday. Dad slides into a pew in the back and you sit next to him. The priest walks up to the pulpit and the music swells, lift every voice and sing. Fills, you, fills every crevice of the hall. People stand as the church choir begins their final song. As the music swells, you realize you know the song they're singing. I used to sing it to you whenever you were upset. Do you turn on our stereo and insert her Thomas Dorsey CD and sing along? Your dad has a CD hidden under the front seat of his car. Others join in, the voice is loud and sure. You look over at dad. He's singing quietly, eyes closed, swaying gently. When the song ends, everyone hugs before gathering outside. Elena comes over to you as you placing a store-bought cheese platter on the table. She is one of the first people you met after moving here. She envelops you in a hug before holding you by the shoulders to take a good look. You're too skinny as always, she says with a smile before turning and filling up a plate for you. She hands it to you, a mountain of, of salami mac and cheese cookies. She's become a second mother to you. You hope she knows that. You want to tell her that you eat all the time, but don't. You know she'll just take it back. You know she'll just take back the plate and add even more to it if you do. You take a bite of the mac and cheese and give it a small smile. You ask her about your kid, about her kids. The youngest is two years older than you and just started his first year of college. The oldest is about to graduate. She smiles proudly 
before going off to catch someone before they leave. You watch her go, she wraps someone else in a hug. You turn back to the table, setting down the plate. The crowd begins to thin and you're recruited to help clean up. You kick in the legs of the folding table and help carry it down to the basement. When you come back outside, Dad is leaning against the trunk of his car. On the way home, you listen to the platinum edition of Beyonce's self-titled album, Beyonce, which Dad thinks is her best. You blast the volume as you sing ring off at the top of your lungs. When you get home, you eat another shuku shuku. The coconut flakes fall onto the floor. In the living room, the grandfather clock chimes noon. You try not to think about the 12 hours remaining to earn back your melanin, to earn back your melanin. You go upstairs before you change. You go upstairs to change before leaving. You toss a black meter on the bed, watching it bounce before it settles. 41% black. Wow. Jess, thank you so much. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, first of all, I mean, so uh, the second person <laughs> is, it's amazing because, you know, um, there's sort of this, this really like at first, it's sort of like, oh, it's interesting. It's in second person. And after about 30 seconds, it's more like, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? Like it's, it's very, um, uh, tense and, and nerve wracking. And also just the, the premise that you, that you've come up with here is so brilliant because, you know, there is a cultural perception that especially that there are people who are more legitimate or not within a given culture, right? And the idea that what strips people of their own identity, which should and does, you know, for them, take whatever shape they would like, that they're stripped of this identity by people saying dumb, hurtful things to them is, is so genius because it, uh, you know, that's, again, as with everything that we've discussed tonight, these, these are not experiences that I have directly. This is, I need to preface everything I say with that. This is not something I can fully understand. This is, you know, a discomfort that I, I have not had to live with, but at the same time, um, it, 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 the, all of the works that I've heard tonight. And this is funny because we don't have themes consciously. This is not something that's, that's planned exactly. Uh, but it always happens. It always happens that people are, are sort of in the same similar vein. And I think, um, your, what you read tonight has such a, or do we, maybe Nilly does plan everything. I don't know, but, um, uh, such a resonance of not just okay this person has taken away your own cultural identity and your own sense of cultural identity by saying this thing that is almost comically dumb if it wasn't something that people really kind of said to people right if it wasn't something that you could actually imagine a guy saying it would be funny but unfortunately people do say dumb things like this. Um, and then, and then I love that, that the character, uh, has to then figure out what is the activity that will restore her culture. What's the activity that will, what do you go do to prove or rebecome to earn it as you said? And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's sort of wonderful that, you know, the, 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 you know, the theft, the, the, these other activities, no effect, nothing connecting with family, connecting with community, connect like that. These are the things that, that do it right. That it is not about, um, gosh, I'm struggling with words today. I apologize that it's not about, um, behaving according to it is about going and being with I th I, that's what i got out of it um that is fantastic so i'm gonna i'm gonna just ask you to unmute because i'm just curious so you were referred i think by one of your it's it 
Melissa, right? Is one of your professors, is she? Yeah. How that's yeah. so thanks to her. And you're currently uh at American University. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is this um part of a larger work? Is this sort of like a is it unclear so far? Where are you at with this? Because I, I would love to read more of this. Um there's only like the first it's only nine pages. Um it's not part of a larger work. I thought about making it mm. longer, but then I didn't want to make it too much. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's only nine pages. Well, that's that's totally fine. I mean, it was it was fantastic, and I think you know whether whether it's uh, more, you know stories from within this world where the where the blackometer exists whether it is you know just along the same lines like please continue exploring this because this is this is is absolutely engrossing and um you know much like i said with with uh terry and susanna's poetry you know mind changing for for people who you know these for people where this these very real issues that in fact statistically m most people in the world would have to deal with because there is this sort of eurocentric hegemony in the world um you know these are voices and stories and thoughts that need to get out and also thoughts that need to be provoked for us and i'm in no way saying the onus is on people who have historically been oppressed to, to teach us anything. It's more just that these are the kinds of things that actually reach people. And that is such a wonderful balance to strike. So thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing. And also uh, Terry just dropped in the chat that she MFA from AU in 2004. So you're amongst company here as well. So I, I'm just going to say, look out everybody. American universities is doing things. <laughs> So anyway, Jess, thank you so much. And uh, Noli put your Twitter in the chat. So that's that's how to keep up with you at the moment. Yes, thank, thank you all. Um, yeah. It's been a great pleasure reading here. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So, all right. Wow, this is a, okay, we're doing good. This, this, I love when, here's the thing. I know I do a lot of weird things where I pause and I look up like this and it's because I'm thinking, I don't know what it looks like on the camera. It might look really weird. I'm not sure. But um, when I have to uh, stretch a bit and, and really get at what it is inside me that I'm, that is reacting to people's work, those are the, the best nights, both for myself, I think for everyone else who's watching, I think all of these things, you know, these are the nights where, we really have to have to do some effort and I think using our brains in a positive way. So our next reader uh, currently for writing purposes goes by a uh, single name, what I think might be called a mononym. And uh, I already clarified, it has nothing to do with the television program with Emmanuel Lewis from the 1980s. Uh, she goes by Webster. Uh, for publication purposes, R.H. Webster, uh, she grew up in rural Alabama, reading everything she could get her hands on. She started writing her first novel at the ripe old age of 13. And while that particular work remains incomplete, she never lost the dream to one day become a novelist. She now lives in sunny El Paso, Texas, with her other half and two adorable terrier mix rescue puppies named Charlie and Rosie. Her first novel, Lucky, was published in 2018, and the sequel, Striking It Rich, in 2020. Her short story, Nil Bid, was published in Passageways by Writing Block in 2020 as well. Her books are available in print and ebooks wherever books are sold, and in audio from Audible. All right, Webster, you should be able to take us away and close us out. Hello. Everyone can hear me okay, correct? I tend to be soft-spoken, so I wanted to check. Um, tonight, I want to read to you the first of four sections um, from Nil Bid, which came out in 2020 in the Passageways Anthology. Um, all of the links I gave to Noli. And um, I tried to time this out, so fingers crossed I don't go over. <clears throat> 
The bar was a dive, dim and damp in every corner. The furniture was dark and worn, the glasses scratched and old. The small windows were cloudy with buildup from Newport's ubiquitous fog, hiding the patrons of the bar from any eyes outside. All of this was fine with Luke and Wright. As a matter of fact, with his beard a bit unkempt and his clothing worn and unremarkable, he fit right in. After leaving the Cerberus almost a decade ago, he had spent his fair share of time in places like this, and he'd learned how to be invisible in plain sight. Long years spent avoiding attention and authorities had engraved a habit of caution on his soul, which made what he was about to do that much more irrational. His target sat across the bar, looking as uncomfortable about her surroundings as he was used to them. He hadn't seen Michael Hannon in over a year, but she appeared completely unchanged, where he felt weary, aged, and had noticed new lines at the corners of his eyes. Her brown skin was still ageless across high cheekbones and around large, penetrating eyes. At least this time, she wasn't waving a gun at him. She nursed the dark beer in front of her, reading a flex screen, but not seeming to be truly invested in the task. Lucan took a deep breath, stealing his resolve. It was now or never. She would be leaving Newport in the morning, and he would have lost the best opportunity he was likely to get. Michael took another pull from her bottle. Her eyes drifted closed. Lucan took the opportunity to soundlessly slide into the booth across from her. He took in her appearance in a fraction of a second. Standard issue clothing, the white collar of a shirt showing under a dark jacket with a federal agent's insignia on the left shoulder. Her dark hair was woven into tiny innumerable braids, which were pulled into a bun on the back of her head. I hear the local beers on this planet will make you go blind, he said conversationally. Her eyes flew open wide. I beg your pardon, she said, coughing slightly with surprise. Can I help you? I certainly hope so. I need a ride home. He folded his hands on the tabletop, showing her that they were empty and waited. Her eyes narrowed at him and she breathed a quiet curse as recognition flashed across her face. Luke and Wright, she said, her voice back to its normal clear tones. He flinched at her obvious disregard for subtlety. He shook his head in frustration and sank deeper into the shadows of her booth. See if you can say it a little louder, would you? He hissed. I was trying to avoid the authorities. She arched a flawless eyebrow at him. I hate to break it to you, buddy, she said, tapping the patch on her left shoulder, but I am the authorities. But if your pals don't see me, you can pretend I was never here. And why would I do that? He could hear a hint of challenge in her voice. He took a deep breath as if readying himself for a plunge into icy waters. I need your help. I'm almost afraid to ask. Michael shot back without missing a beat. I need to get to Earth and I need to get there fast. So go to Earth. Newport to Earth is the busiest route outside of the solar system. Shouldn't be tough for a smart guy like you to find a ship that will take you. Lucan shook his head his finger tracing a groove in the wood grain of the table between them. It's not that simple, he said, his voice still low. I have orders from the Junto not to leave the sector. He had her attention now. He could tell by her body language, the way her shoulders turned toward him and her flex screen lay discarded and darkened on the table as the screen timed out. The rising power of the Junto political movement across the colonies was being met with panic from Earth-based federal governments and Michael Hannon was part of an anti-Junto task force that had been formed in the last year. She leaned forward on the table. What's so important on earth that you were willing to defy orders to get there? He scanned the bar, making it look like a casual glance, but systematically taking stock of the situation, left to right. No one had moved. There were no new faces in the building. Colleen Staple is in the hospital, he said not meeting Michael's gaze. They don't expect her to survive. He took a deep breath, steadying himself. She and Isabel are the only family I have left. I have to say goodbye. 
Michael sat back slowly, a look of concerned sympathy crossing her face before she shook her head. You're a known Junto operative, Michael told him, her face stony and businesslike again. I know, he said. And after that mess on Avondale, I could get separated simply for talking to you without taking you into custody. He nodded. I know. And it's not any less than what the Junto would do to me if they caught me here talking to you. This is a risk for both of us. She took another long drink from the bottle, studying him. What are you expecting me to do then? He took another deep breath. His heart was hammering in his chest, even if he appeared outwardly calm and calculating. This wasn't just another political operation. This time, if he failed, there wouldn't be a second chance. Michael had always been tough, but he knew if he could just convince her, it would all work out. Help me get off this planet and pass customs on Earth. Say I'm in custody or whatever. She paused, her eyes narrowing. And why would I help you? Because you're a good person, Lucan said. And because I think you know that I would do the same thing for you if the situation was reversed. Her eyebrows rose skeptically and he shrugged a little bit. Time to sweeten the offer. And because I know things that you want to know. For a brief moment, Michael looked like she would say yes. He knew she wanted all the information he had, but then she shook her head, not looking up at him. I can't do this, she muttered. There's no way we could pull it off and I'd lose my career. You can't just be in custody one minute, then wandering around Colorado the next. Lucan felt his stomach sink. He had hoped she would be more understanding and more enticed by his offer of intelligence, but he had a plan bravo if she didn't see it his way. He didn't want to have to play dirty, but desperate times called for dick moves. He sighed and pulled out a flex screen and unfolded it, laying it flat on the table. I heard what happened with your inquiry, he said, tapping the document. She grabbed the flex screen and skimmed it. Where did you get this? She gasped, shock again crossing her features. Those were sealed proceedings. If there's one thing the Junto are incredibly good at, it's information. He reached over and tapped the screen, causing it to change. It's a crazy thing. What happened on the Rosebud? Such a shame that your star witness on the case died on the way back to Earth. He stole a glance at her. Her eyes were wary and a faint sheen of sweat showed on her cheeks. He held down the tight smile he felt rising. She was good but he had her where he wanted her. He grabbed the flex screen and pulled up a picture of a brown haired man with blue eyes. His arms wrapped around a heavily pregnant woman in a wedding dress. Their surroundings were lush and tropical, the kind of paradise any human in the galaxy might dream of. He turned the picture toward Michael. It would be a shame if something were to happen to them, wouldn't it? She quickly folded the screen, hiding the picture. Leave him out of it. She snapped, glancing around the bar. It was quick, but Lucan could tell it was the same methodical, practiced, left to right scan he had learned in basic training. He's a nice enough guy, Lucan agreed. I even like that new name you picked for him. Martin Colburn sounds, he paused somewhat theatrically, like he was thinking. Strong, like a down to earth family man. He reached for the flex screen and slipped it back into his jacket. But you know any good code slicer with the right equipment would just uncover his previous name and record. And when that happens, not only would you be on the hook for lying under oath, but he'd be on the hook for so much more. Lucan could see that Michael was grinding her teeth, not meeting his eyes. Fine, she said, anger releasing the single syllable. But the information you give me better be worth two years of intelligence work. Lucan nodded. Thank you, he said. You won't regret this. She finished off the beer. Wanna bet? It was a disgruntled mutter. She set the bottle on the table with a decisive thump. The spellbinder takes off at 0600 tomorrow. If you're not in the docking bay before 05, your arrogant, selfish ass is getting left on this mothball and I'll call the local cops on you. And right, Michael's voice turned darkly dangerous and her eyes flashed a warning. 
after you're done at the hospital, you'll be in federal custody for real. Lucan's stomach plummeted, feeling as if the floor had dropped or had disappeared from under his feet. That wasn't part of the offer, deal or no deal, she said. Her tone allowed no room for argument. She stood and swiped her card over the reader at the corner of the table. This was it. Lucan felt it. This was one of those moments when a single syllable would change his life forever. His heart pounded in his chest and his throat felt tight. There was only one choice to make. Deal. The word choked him. Wow. I, all right, Webster, thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderfully um, entertaining and intriguing. And, you know, it's, it's one of these things where um, I think it's, mm, I don't want to say it's easy because none of it is easy in terms of making things or creating things. It's relatively easy to spin out the world that you're writing about in exposition and in description. It is much harder to do, do it with just dialogue or it's not just dialogue, but mo mainly dialogue. But I loved the amount of information we got out of it and the world that it exists in. And, you know, to, to sort of tie it back into a, a theme that, you know, we've um, been hitting on tonight, in a sense, uh, it's really interesting what happens to the dynamics and the expectations when the uh, woman is the authority figure. <laughs> and in power and the man needs something from her um it, it immediately changes and sort of inverts situations and adds all this sort of intrigue and and um almost like a sense of uh i don't know if this is actually a word but unpredictability like you're not sure what's it's something seems slippery and dangerous and and questionable about it and i think that's that's such an interesting thing that just I, don't, I know that's not all because obviously there is a backstory for both of these characters and they are now intersecting, but there is something strictly about that when she says, I'm the authorities that, that sort of gives you this like, Ooh, wait a second, this is weird. Is she, is she cause it's funny. Um, not that she does, but a, a male, uh, federal agent or what, you know, uh, agent of any description abusing their power is almost expected. And then a female, it's like, Ooh, what's she going to do with it? What's, what's going to happen? Um, and I think that is uh, such a wonderful, I don't want to say inversion because it's not like, it's not like one is always true and the other isn't. It's just, there's something about that setting that really sort of sets up a really interesting dynamic. I guess that's the way I would put it. Um, so this is from the latest uh, book of yours, which is available now. I just let, uh, yeah, there you go. Yes, um, this one came out in December of 2020. It's an anthology of uh, nine stories and it was published by Writing Block, which is another group fairly similar to this actually. Hmm. And um, every story in this book is connected to an other or a previously established literary world. Um, so since I have two novels that take place in this world, um, I went ahead and this short story is taking, <laughs> yay MK, you make my life happy. <laughs> um, th so this not, this particular story takes someone who is almost a tertiary character in my second novel and promotes them to protagonist status. Mm. And I have focused very hard on making each segment of the series a standalone mm -hmm. um, because my pet peeve are people who like um, a very famous fantasy writer who had a very famous television show that ended very badly sort of a large man with a beard and a silly hat yes yes and he has a thing for dragons and naked women mm -hmm. and um he started and he started a series and then never finished it mm -hmm. And I'm like, buddy, you're killing me. Um, so I have sworn not to do that to my readers where I will maybe plant the seeds of another idea in one book. But if it, 
you know, if you pick up in the middle of the story, I still want it to feel like a complete story that you can, you sure. know, sink your teeth into. Um, and then book three will eventually come into being. Mm -hmm. I got to, I got to work on that. <laughs> That's all right. For now, uh, I'm curious with, with passageways, you said one, one of these was your own work. Um, yes. Maybe what are a couple of examples of, of the other works that you got to write into the world of? Um, oh, well, these are not all stories by me. Sorry. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Um, they're by nine different authors with nine different um, worlds. And I've, I've read all of these others. They're fascinating. Um, there was one just off the top of my head. It's a, a fey world. I don't know if you're familiar with urban fantasy, but it's essentially fairies, selkies, werewolves, and they all live in modern day Boston, mm. um, which is fine. My particular world is a distant future space Western. So there are cantinas and tumbleweeds and George Strait playing in the background. Not at all inspired by me living in El Paso. <laughs> I say very sarcastically. <laughs> The only question that remains to be answered is which planet do all of your exes live on? Oh, um, <laughs> definitely on Earth and in Texas. Sorry, that was a joke that I have milked uh, for all that it's worth as I was driving across Texas, uh, just texting people saying like, I heard some of your exes live here. Um, and I, yeah. At any rate, uh, well, that's great that, that that's available now. And for more information, you know, MK, or, pff, MK, I just saw the words MK. Hi, MK. Uh, no, Noli posted a bunch of links to your work and links to uh, where to find uh, the two books that are out now, as well as audiobooks. So yes. that's wonderful. It's, think. it's very exciting. The audiobook for the second novel just got released today on oh. Audible. So it was, it's been a very busy day marketing wise in my house. <laughs> mm, I can imagine. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to touch on just before we wrap up was the line, um, desperate times call for dick moves. That A, I will definitely be saying, and B, um, there were suggestions in the chat there about, about putting that on a t-shirt. So we might have to talk about uh, a TGI Webster collaboration. Um, and also this just led me to the general thought, which is why don't writers have merch? We got to make that happen. Oh, I uh, totally have merch. Oh, okay. I have t-shirts. All right. Hey, so, has my t-shirt. So people can find that at your website, I'm sure, if they yeah. check it out. I can, um, I tell you what, I'll grab you a link right now. Okay. All right. Well, for now, I'm going to close up the show, but Webster, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I would thank you. look forward to reading some more. All right, folks, that will bring it to a close for tonight. A uh, pretty wide variety of works, all interesting and thought-provoking to me um, across different spectrums. And that's really the thing here. I couldn't come up with a better word than thing just then. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the thing, the, the, the aspect of this that has been wonderful is, you know, we get once a week to sit here have an earnest discussion about some things, listen to some people, and also just take a trip into the world of, you know, for each of these, uh, you know, for the, the poets and writers that read tonight, um, this work is a large portion of their life and we get to, you know, visit it for a, a little while and also get um, information about where we can find more. And, and I think the more that I create things or try to create things, the more I <clears throat> um, want to see what other people are making. Because I know that there are other people who are just as interested and obsessed with trying to express the thing that they think is important in this world. So I feel honored. Thank you all the writers uh, so much for coming tonight. Thank you to all the audience for coming. Again, please you know, stick around after if you'd like to chat. Um, for information about the show, you can go to tgicast.com, uh, which may soon have a merch button. We'll let you know. Um, you can find uh, the show on Twitter at TGICast. You can find me on Twitter at my name, Bridge Cresswell, two S's, two L's. Uh, you can find the show's creator, uh, spiritual pillar, um, uh, strongest core strength that I'm aware of, Trina Thibodeau. 
at uh, on Twitter at Trina Tibbs, T-R-E-E-N-A-T-H-I-B-S. And you can find the show's scheduler, booker, and refer people to the show, much as Melissa Skulls Young did with uh, Jessica. Um, and I think probably most of the people who've been on the show lately were referred by someone at some point um, by contacting Noli Reed, our, our uh, executive vice president of talent relations, as I like to call her. Uh, with that thank you all so much uh i'm gonna wrap things up for now but uh please we hope to see you again uh stay safe and take care